the big issue here is at what point does pollination and the input costs that affect agriculture start to affect the viability of my family farm. And as I look at the future, I look at handing off this ranch to my son and to the future generations, I, I have to wonder how much more viable can we be. And I'm a little concerned about that. I'm actually really concerned. It was obvious in 1860, 1870, that eventually it would make sense to stop trying to accumulate more and more and more. There's limits to what we can get out of nature. There's limits to why we'd want to consume more. John Stuart Mill actually has beautiful passages about surely someday we'll, get, we'll stop elbowing and pushing and stomp, stomping on each other's feet and get out of the market mentality, the competitive world. We're pushing the bees to the limit. We're asking, you know, way too much of the bees already, and that's why we're, we're having problems. It's like death by a thousand cuts. We're, we keep, you know, doing things that shorten their life and shorten their life and shorten their life, and we've pushed bees now to that point where they can't do it anymore. They can't take anymore. No, literally every country in the world has changed its natural ecosystems. Europe, North America, we lost most of our forests a couple of hundred, several hundred years ago, and we converted them to very rich, powerful agricultural systems. Many developing countries are using that same economic growth model, and yet at the same time, not fully realizing the true value of what they're losing. Stay tuned to Nature Inc. as we show how the raw material for this and this is thanks to these bats in Africa. This is the poverty-stricken dry belt in Ghana in West Africa. Until recently, nearly everything here was for local consumption, but change is coming. And for the first time, the people living here have the chance to escape poverty. And it's all the result of a decision made far away in Brussels. These are shear trees, and although none of them has been planted by man, they are the source of shear butter, the fat extracted from the nuts. In 2003, the EU allowed the use of non-cocoa fat to be used in chocolate, and shear is regarded as the best substitute for cocoa butter. The shear industry is already worth $20 million a year to Ghana and the market for the seeds of the drought-resistant crop is growing fast. Senya Capelli is one of the entrepreneurs whose business is booming. This dedicated production centre will be up and running in a few months' time. In 2003, we exported about 5 metric tonnes of shea butter. 2004, it, it doubled to 10 metric tonnes. In 2007, we exported between 50 metric tonnes to 100 metric tonnes. But the booming trade relies on one of nature's much maligned workers. Some trees here appear to be laden with fruit. But it's not fruit, it's fruit bats, otherwise known as flying foxes. The largest species of bat in the world. The bats have an important role to play in the life cycle of the tree. Many shea trees started out as seeds spread by bats. Human beings don't plant them because it takes too long to see any benefits. The shea nut tree takes about 30 years to get matured. Now, this discourages people to invest into the cultivation of shea nut tree. Because if you are going to plant tree for 30 years before you start enjoying it, it's almost uh, impossible. But the bats, they are doing their job all the time. And uh, their activity, they are planting more trees. The bats' unpaid labor is the basis for a whole regional economy. In the local language, the shea tree is called tama and this Ghanaian city is called Tamale, literally the place of shear trees. The markets here are full of the nuts and also shear butter, the most valuable product of the tree. It's often used in expensive skin creams and cosmetics and the shear butter trade could soon transform the lives of millions of Ghanaians thanks to the world's insatiable taste for chocolate.
Globally, each year, the chocolate industry is worth $74 billion, which is more than the diamond industry. Chocolate is still made from the cocoa bean, but soaring demand and political instability where the cocoa bean is grown has left a shortfall in cocoa butter that shea butter is now filling. This thriving business relies on bats, but they don't get much thanks for it. They have always suffered from a bad press. Around the world, they are often associated with the tiny vampire bat, seen as evil and dangerous. I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what, Gringer? The bats, sir. Big, giant bats with wings like an eagle. But in reality, it is the bat that is the victim. Bats, or flying foxes, are actually harmless vegetarians. Globally, some 200 species play an important role as forest pollinators and seed dispersers. Yet they are often seen as a pest of industrial fruit plantations. Here in West Africa, with an insatiable appetite for bushmeat, they are killed mostly for food. Globally, one in five species of fruit bat are considered threatened. Bat is a delicacy. If you go through, if you go to all markets all over the country, you will see bats. They are hunted daily. Uh, you, you can never see a bat uh, on any tree near human beings, and uh, children will not be throwing stones at the at the bat. So uh, what the bats have done these days is, uh, they are as they are being hunted all over. They now go to places like uh, the military barracks, where nobody can go there and disturb them. A military hospital in Accra is home to one of West Africa's largest colony of fruit bats. Here, they're protected from hunters by the military. In the eyes of um, probably animal lovers, they might look like persecution. But then, for people who want food, economic purposes, it's food. And above all, it's just blatant disregard for the conservation laws because they are protected species. The unlucky ones end up here. Accra's bushmeat market. They have some eating places there that deal in the bushmeat. This, this is one lot coming in now. This, this one, this is certainly the main market for bushmeat. Many kinds of wild animals are considered a delicacy, and contrary to expectations, the trade in their meat is not illegal. Some, like these grass cutters, are abundant, and their hunting is not controlled. Other species, like bats, are subject to an open and a closed season. Here, any bush meat is traded. They are also aware of the holy protected species that we have in the country. So when they get any one of them, they either don't bring it here or they hide it to sell. But any bush meat, including the bats, are of delicacy to the people. Yeah. These are bats here for sale. How much is about what you're saying? The fate of Ghana's fruit bats is not just a matter for wildlife lovers. While a dead fruit bat is worth about 60 US cents in the market as meat, the economic value of a live bat in the wild is becoming more obvious. The living bats are a hidden but vital link in the rapidly growing shear industry. Each one works for Nature Inc. by scattering shea seeds over the dry north of the country and planting the next generation of shea trees. There must be uh, agencies that uh, must fight and educate the people about the importance of uh, keeping these bats because uh, they are very uh, uh, useful for this industry. A shea tree will fruit for more than a century, so it's a fantastic return on the work of bats and other animals in spreading the seeds. And if we want our shea butter business to go up for cosmetics, for balms and other things, and even for using confectionery, then we should help the bats to continue spreading the seeds. They are here for a purpose. So who are the movers and shakers? Who are the people with a vision to keep nature in working order? In each episode of Nature Inc., the end note comes from the visionaries. This week we hear from the head of global markets of one of the world's largest banks. One of the first things that I learned as a young banker is that you cannot manage what you do not measure. And that is our fundamental problem today. We have a broken economic compass. GDP growth does not account for, does not capture the many values of flows from nature into the economy. 
Sukdev is preparing a groundbreaking report sponsored by the German government on the economic value of nature. Its aim is to convince politicians across the world that conserving nature is good for business. I'm not sure that we can save the world, but we can certainly present enough information with sufficient clarity which enables the world to save itself. Economics is mere weaponry. The direction in which you shoot is your choice. It's very often an ethical choice. Next week on Nature Inc, we find out how some cities have slashed their bills by billions of dollars by using forests to purify their water.